This podcast was produced by ORFM Dunedin with support from New Zealand On the Air. The young shining cuckoo is fed by its foster parents on insects and spiders. But the korimako, or bellbird, has a much more interesting diet of nectar. It's been something of a radio personality and has sung on shortwave radio to Australia and the Pacific nations for 30 years. However, the early recordings failed to reflect the versatility of the bellbird, with its wide variety of liquid notes and artistically placed clicks and bell-like sounds. It's not surprising that Maori mythology describes Korimako, the bellbird, as the messenger of Tane, sent to herald the coming of the sun. Community or chaos, we can construct and nurture community or fall into chaos. Over the next hour, Marvin Hubbard hosts conversations toward creating a fairer, more equal society. Community or Chaos is made possible with the support of Quakers Aotearoa. You'll find them online at quaker.org.nz. Good morning, friends. Welcome back to Community or Chaos. We have with us Sanjana Hatakwa from uh, Peace and Conflict Studies at Otago University, and he's one of the curators of the Conference on New Ecosystem Democracy in the Age of Social Media. And he's doing his PhD at the Peace and Conflict Studies Center. He's from Sri Lanka, and but has a wide range of overseas posts and experience, particularly with social media and the online. You can podcast this by going to oar.org.nz and then going to Community or Podcast and then Community or Chaos. A welcome to Community or Chaos, Sanjay. Thank you very much. Ruthie, what has been your work and experience in Sri Lanka and elsewhere before becoming a student at the Otago National Center for Peace and Conflict Studies? Well, in the late 90s, as an undergraduate student at the University of Delhi, um, the uh, Indian subcontinent and all of South Asia was going through a fairly important change, one that we recognize now and have studied more, but I was living it, in that uh, with the advent and introduction of uh, the Internet and the World Wide Web and dial-up modems connecting computers to the web, a lot of people were going online for the first time, and I found this fascinating and uh, how they were going online, what they were talking about, how they were expressing themselves. And I really got interested in how societies connect with each other and see each other online, in addition to, of course, uh, human-to-human contact and physical uh, relationships. That then led to uh, 20 years before I came here, uh, activism and work and advocacy and basically trying to use technology for uh, the strengthening of our better angels in society. Sri Lanka has gone through 30 years of war. It ended in 2009 in a very bloody end. Uh, And a lot of countries, unlike an Aotearoa New Zealand, have very different histories and very conflicted, violent histories. Uh, And the internet and the web and social media today has contributed to exacerbating some of those histories and social schisms. And in other ways, it has helped bring people together. And so for those nearly two decades, I was studying that kind of phenomenon, uh, doing a lot of work uh, using web, internet, social media platforms and tools and apps and services to kind of really bring out the democratic potential and pathways as opposed to the hate, hurt, violence and harm that is usually the focus of the media. So that's a, a lot of work <laughs> over 20 years that I've compressed into a short soundbite. Uh, briefly, how were you and your family and community affected by the violence in Sri Lanka? Well, it, the, the war ended in 2009, and since that time we have been debating the nature in which that war ended. But the larger conversation really is why the war began in uh, and lasted for so long and resulted in so many dead. Uh, 
uh, and those structural conditions for violence, the racism that is inherent in society, the discrimination that is inherent and written into the structures of the state uh, from the everyday negotiation of it to the overt manifestation uh, in the symbols of the state and the transactions of government. Um, it is a country that really hasn't come to terms with its past and doesn't want to either in any meaningful way. And so different people experience this differently. Um, I remember as a child of five or six in 1983, July, seeing the most horrific violence, uh, having to walk back home that day uh, on the 23rd of July when Colombo was uh, literally in flames and, and there was a pogrom against the Tamil community both in Colombo uh, but also it spread very quickly elsewhere in uh, uh, outwards across the island. These are scars, these are societal scars that are very, very deep and unless and until you really grasp and uh, meaningfully address them and acknowledge that they happened and the reasons why they happened, uh, you're not necessarily going to revisit the past, but you're never going to address it, which of course means that it's going to result in manifestations of violence into the future. And the the the, the purpose of my study here and my work has been to interrogate and look at really how uh, online communications and most re recently social media exacerbates unaddressed violence of the past, amplifies it, and then repackages it so that there is a greater proclivity for that violence to uh, raise its head again in the future. So different. I can't speak for all communities. I really can't speak for all people. Um, but I can speak generally in saying that both my generation, my age, uh, who kind of grew up um, in the war and lived to see the end of it uh, and lived uh, and recall the violence of 1983, uh, as well as, of course, the younger generation, which was born afterwards, um, we are all shaped by this violence. We are all shaped by this conflict. It's not something you can escape from. And I think in uh, Terawa, New Zealand, one is very fortunate to not have that degree of violence, overt, physical, kinetic war, uh, but of course, all countries and all communities and all contexts have to deal with their past and deal with ingrained racism and violence. And certainly that's what recommends um, the conference that was held last week uh, to our Terawa audiences as well. Could you briefly talk about the conference? Well, the conference was held on the 16th and 17th of March 2021 and is, uh, is, a, is the culmination of uh, a, a partnership called a Data for Good partnership with Twitter that was the first of its kind in Aotearoa, New Zealand with Twitter. Uh, it has an interesting story. Um, I didn't come to Aotearoa, New Zealand thinking that I'm going to study what I uh, was studying back home until, of course, the events of 15th March uh, 2019 in Christchurch, where I pivoted my uh, research to look at what happened that day uh, and since that day. And I published around six or seven op-eds uh, in New Zealand's uh, print media. One of them caught the attention of Twitter because it was uh, interrogating what was the dominant narrative at the time around how social media was all bad and all evil and contributed to the terrorism and the violence that we experienced on the 15th of March. And I had a very different take that uh, was really quite extraordinary where I looked at Twitter and uh, all of the content in tens of thousands of tweets in the first 48 hours and then the first week after the attacks was what you call pro-social. It was empathetic, um, deeply uh, partial to the victims, didn't uh, inflame hate, uh, wasn't partial to the terrorist or the terrorisms, uh, condemned the act of violence, was uh, openly in favor of uh, and partial to and supportive of Aotearoa New Zealand's diversity and democracy, and complemented and amplified by the timber and tone and thrust of the political leadership here, uh, you know, you found a really interesting discourse that was extremely hopeful and extremely positive. 
uh, on on that one platform uh, within and also in a global uh, conversation on Aotearoa New Zealand. So I put that out, got the attention of Twitter, and they wanted me to interrogate it a bit more, which I did, and it has subsequently become a uh, a, a major chapter in my thesis and this conference was really looking at some of the issues that I've been both looking at in the research here but also in my life over 20 years I've been blessed with relationships as a consequence of the work that I've done in Sri Lanka with major social media companies and other contexts and countries and communities across the world dealing with these issues so I brought all of that together and I thought listen you have the Royal Commission's report on uh, Christchurch New Zealand and Aotearoa are at a crucial, t- you know, a critical stage uh, to have some of these discussions moving forward, particularly around social cohesion, which is a large chunk of the recommendations in the Royal Commission's report. And I thought it, it would be very timely to have some of these discussions here, bringing the global conversation to Aotearoa and taking Aotearoa's experience to the world, so the conversation, uh, the the conference had twelve conversations, twelve sessions, bringing in a range of speakers, extraordinary, world-renowned, uh, award-winning speakers, uh, talking to a lot of the issues that uh, really uh, are at the centre and heart of what governments today around the world and here too are dealing with in 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 all of these issues that we're talking about. So academically, Marvin, you have these names and you call them information disorders and disinformation and misinformation. And for the listeners, this might be all be gobbledygook. Essentially, what the con- conference was trying to get at was in a world that we are struggling to understand the workings of, where media and journalism and democracy and society and communal relations and how we see each other are being informed and shaped and influenced by things we are really struggling to grasp, how then can we best inoculate our Aotearoa New Zealand against, for example, that which we see uh, in my home country in Sri Lanka. So I don't want Aotearoa to kind of mirror and map uh, what's gone wrong back home in Sri Lanka. And the, in the, and the conversation and the conference was really around how we can get this right. Um, because Aotearoa New Zealand, I think, is at a historical moment where it can do a lot of things right. And the interest was in supporting those endeavours. Why was the response after Christchurch massacre slightly different than many other countries? Oh, that's a very interesting question, Marvin. I think that uh, fundamentally, and if we can break it down with some violence to the uh, <laughs> to the research, if we can break it down, uh, it is because you have here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, a uh, media, political uh, culture uh, together and also independently that is really quite fundamentally different from uh, many other contexts, countries and communities um, my research looked at the aftermath of the Easter Sunday terrorism uh, that same year, a month after the Christchurch massacre here, where around six uh, times as many people perished uh, in a spate of coordinated suicide attacks on Easter Sunday in April uh, 2019. And the response on social media writ large, but also on Facebook and Twitter, was complicated, but it was also very, very different from our terror. It was far more violent, hateful, and amplifying um, the worst of society as opposed to the best of what we can be. And I think that, you know, as I said and I hinted at earlier, it was the timber the empathetic uh, empathetic approach and framing the language the deliberate use of uh, uh, you know public spaces to uh, be with the victims and to express support for the victims there's a whole range of things here coupled with i think what has been repeatedly flagged here is that you have a media culture in Aotearoa, which is, you know, fairly fundamentally different, even just in comparison with uh, regions across the Tasman. Um, it it is robust. It is professional. It is, uh, by and large, there's a there's a very strong public uh, service, public broadcasting uh, media services culture here, uh, and so a lot contri- a lot of that contributes to the to to the kind of discussions and content and conversations that you find on social media. So let me put it another way, and I think listeners may be more partial to this perspective, which is that a lot of us fear social media for uh, for reflecting and refracting the worst of who we uh, often are portrayed to be. But after Christchurch, what you found, Marvin, was that social media really captured the best of what Aotearoa New Zealand is and should be and can be and people wanted it to be. Uh, so there was a, there was an extraordinary gathering of voices that 
um, you really didn't find uh, in many other contexts, and that was, you know, that was what what my research also brings out. Uh, and my research brings out many other things. It was as far in far afield as India and Pakistan, in many other languages, in Urdu, Hindi, uh, in Hausa, which is a la- la- language spoken in parts of Africa, in Turkish. So it, there was this moment where the whole world was kind of, there was an outpouring uh, of support for New Zealand. And within New Zealand, you seem to have a political and media culture which really um, you know, predates obviously social media, but is reflected on social media in that it it didn't uh, glorify the violence uh, and its approach to uh, the the massacre. Uh, I don't know whether listeners quite know this because you, you know you probably haven't studied it as much as some of us have, but it's really quite extraordinary, e- even in comparison to other countries uh, that have gone through uh, uh, similar um, mass shootings. So uh, there's something in the culture here that contributes to social media, and there's something in the timber and conversation and content on social media that then amplifies and strengthens that culture as well. So it's a symbiotic relationship. Does some of it have to do with the, if the prime minister hadn't taken an immediate stand of empathy, would that have made a difference? I would hypothesize, yes, based also on my research, Marvin. It is very much indicative of what I have studied in comparison to Sri Lanka and Aotearoa, that political leadership and moreover, what political leaders say and how they say it, how they frame it, the language that they choose, the frames they use, the words they 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 speak matter. And they matter a great deal. They matter a great deal. Social media, when it reflects and amplifies and kind of communicates that and, uh, you know, is a mirror to, to, to that political culture, uh, either... Uh, reflects um, the, the 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 timber of political leadership, um, or it or, or in, in the best of ways, uh, or it uses a, a more hateful framing to really ramp up and amplify uh, hate amongst communities in society. So, again, at some violence to my research, the the kind of uh, content and conversation you saw just on one platform, let's just make it simple, on Twitter after the Easter Sunday terrorism was fundamentally different in Sri Lanka uh, to the kind of response that you had uh, here in in, What kind of response did you have? Oh, it was terrible. It was uh, the amplification of violence. It was Islamophobia. It was the targeting of the Muslims. Um, It was stoking up anxiety and fear and hatred. It was exacerbating uh, older divisions in society and within and between communities. It was what you would call majoritarianism. Uh, It was uh, framing and and defining Sri Lanka as being something very different from the diverse democratic uh, country that, uh, that it is. Uh, so it was very divisive, hateful, harmful, hurtful, violent framing. Uh, of course, the, the, you know this is not the consequence necessarily only of the Easter Sunday terrorism. Uh, this is a problem that uh, my country faces and it has faced for decades and is facing even as we speak here today, Marvin, in our studio. Uh, uh, that is a challenge that we will have to confront. Otherwise, um, uh, we will always be confronted with the kind of violence that we have been uh, saddled with since independence in 1948. Um, but then you don't have that kind of thing here in Aotearoa. And uh, it seems to be the case that when you don't have it in real life, uh, what happens and is said and is spoken of offline deeply influences and informs uh, the content generated online. And as I said, it's a symbiotic relationship. Who Could you talk about how the effect of new technologies has on different cultures. That's one of the things that came up at the conference was that um, Facebook and Twitter and the the use of them, um, not only is something we use, but it also affects how we are. It affects our culture. Oh, very much so. Oh, very much so. uh, and it's complicated and complex, so I can uh, speak of it uh, in terms of my research where uh, even just one platform, say Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, I mean, we, we tend to 
think of it as one thing and it's really not it's facebooks and it's twitters and it's youtubes because it really depends on the context of use and twitter here as you would have uh, gathered from uh, david hood's presentation david hood is 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 with me at the, the institute of otago and is a uh, 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 is is amazing. Uh, he's on Twitter as thoughtful NZ, and he does some really amazing work looking at uh, how uh, uh, people from Aotearoa New Zealand talk with each other on the platform, which is fundamentally different to how people from other parts of the world and other countries talk to each other on the platform. So. The, What's the difference? Well, here it's more like a, a coffee shop discussion. It's friendly. It's uh, it's it, it, people respond to each other far more. There's a greater uh, spirit of conversation. Um, uh, it, it's it's surprising the degree to which there is conversation as opposed to just uh, um, random comments and um, just people spewing off uh, hate at each other. Um, there's a there's a sense of community here. Uh, then there's a a richness in the conversation that you really don't find in many other parts of the world. Uh, Facebook, for example, so that's not the only complicating factor. So in 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 here in New Zealand uh, and in many other parts of the world, even just one platform, it, it is shaped by time as well, and the nature of the events, uh, the, the the platform. Mm. Uh, content is is responding to so you know without losing listeners too much it, it's a very very complex thing and let me put it this way what you often find in the media is um, uh, the framing of these companies or the framing of these platforms as one thing uh, and researchers like to see it as something quite different where these platforms are shaped by the social, political, cultural, communal contexts that they are located in, and then go on to shape them as well. Uh, so uh, the the Facebook in in Sri Lanka at a particular time uh, isn't probably the Facebook today in 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 2021, and won't be the Facebook of 2022 March or April. And likewise, the Twitter of uh, post Christchurch massacre isn't the Twitter today. Um, and so, so on and so forth. So, you, you, you. Uh, the, the other really interesting thing, Marvin, and you know, you've been in, in in radio and broadcasting for I suppose decades, is that the speed, the scope, and the scale of social media is really quite new, uh, and that's changing the way we see ourselves in ways that we are still trying hard to understand, but is really very different from the broadcast and print and electronic media uh, of a few decades ago. That's uh, actually changed. Radio, particularly, I can imagine because we've responded by you can, punk, you can, you don't have to be listening to this program That's or any right. other program. You can uh, podcast it a week away, and you can podcast it in the United States, or you can listen to it on your computer. And I think radio, actually, radio has probably kept up with the new technology better than most older. Well, you, you can say that, and I would tend to agree. So it's not just time shifting, is it? I mean, the the, the challenge of, of social media is that there's an interactivity. Uh, there is an almost immediate feedback loop. Uh, there is the a tendency to react as opposed to respond. And the difference is that reaction is an emotional thing. Response or responding is a more intellectual endeavor. Uh, and social media algorithmically and the manner in which it is presented, the manner in which it is consumed and the manner in which it is engaged with is really very different to what listeners listening to us live would would respond to. And, uh, you know, a few decades ago, you had limited avenues. You had a letter to the editor or maybe a letter to the station saying, listen, this random Sri Lankan uh, isn't wasn't making too much of sense and you would send a complaint but now you can I mean as we are speaking who knows who's tweeting who knows who's putting this up on Facebook and so that creates a, a cycle of its own a feedback loop of its own uh, that we as uh, you know the producer and interviewee uh, have no control over so uh, in 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 extremis uh, in general these new what you call media and information flows uh, create new tensions uh, for democratic institutions and democratic structures uh, around election, but also between elections that uh, I see firsthand in Sri Lanka, but our Aotearoa New Zealand is not inoculated against. And I suppose that's what's exciting and frightening and fascinating at the same time, because there's so much of democratic potential and pathways around all of this, but so much can also go horribly wrong. How much can the public or even the government – 
um, control or decide about new technologies. It's not just um, media, but for instance, the Industrial Revolution, when they went from uh, spinning and weaving in small groups and homes to the factory, they did it not only because it was they could do things faster, but they also they controlled the, the work and the output and the work and the labor. And the, the, the weavers didn't have any real say over that. And I think that happens in many cases with technology. This technology is not necessarily uh, totally neutral in its social no, I think uh, I think you could write my thesis for me, Marvin, because you go into the heart of the problem. Uh, Shoshana Zuboff in Surveillance Capitalism and many others have pointed to the fact that uh, if you're not being sold something, then we are the product. Uh, and there's a whole uh, school of interrogation around um, our agency uh, and how we are being abused and used uh, for the profit of companies that are very far away from us geographically but also uh, politically and in terms of our ethics and values. So um, I suppose one can get lost in the philosophizing of all of this and at risk of losing listeners as well. You can go into that. And and I'm sure that's a worthy endeavor. But I think what the conference and I would would rather be, you know, biased towards or be more interested in, 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 in is you know, from a regulatory perspective, how can and should you address some of these challenges? Uh, And it depends, right? PM Ardern would think of it in one way. Uh, David Shanks, uh, the New Zealand's chief censor, would think of it in another way. And academics would think of it in another way. And no, there's no one right answer. But I think there are things that we can do to strengthen media and information literacy, to strengthen the institutions against, for example, in the post-COVID world, uh, misinformation, uh, conspiracy theories spreading, and for example, one of the consequences could be vaccine hesitancy, uh, and also kind of strengthen and support our educational uh, systems uh, in school, Marvin, uh, so that you know children coming out and when they go to university have a greater recognition of the complexity of the media landscape and are able to critically question. I say this with reason, and our Therwa New Zealand listeners you know, may, may be wondering why I stress this. In Sri Lanka, Marvin, we have one of South Asia's highest adult literacy rates, but one of the poorest uh, information and media literacy, which is actually quite dangerous if you think about it, because we consume a lot of content, but we aren't able to critically question that which we consume which results in, along with the uh, prevalence and ubiquity of social media, people getting bombarded with content from multiple sources, not just from traditional broadcasters, and they aren't able to kind of really fathom what's right, what's wrong, what's true, what's false. Uh, And then that leads to a lot of problems, also because our institutions are not fit for purpose anymore. Can you talk about what Finland's done for... Yes, very much so. So, you see, you know, that's the classic example, isn't it? Because Finland is often held up as a country that has very early on identified this to be really at the heart of democracy and also because they have Russia to deal with as well and incorporated and mainstreamed media and information literacy in Karakula from a very young age. Uh, and there's a lot of content on, on, on the web around how successful they've been at creating a population uh, or engineering a society that is not necessarily impervious to conspiracy theories, but uh, it's very, very difficult uh, to, uh, in Finland, uh, spread falsehoods and rumor uh, and misinformation because the media, the average media consumer whatever age demographic that they are in, uh, really critically analyzes and tries to frame that which they read without immediately sharing or liking or or sending it or forwarding it or putting it up on on their respective accounts. So that is one model. Uh, But may I also stress, Marvin, I think that Again, I think it needs to be said that uh, the, 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 the media culture in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, is, is also something that inoculates 
at least for the moment, uh, that which we see that is going around uh, wrong uh, in other parts of the world, including across the Tasman. Now, there are many reasons for that. Um, well, it's not popular in New Zealand to insult people or <laughs> attack people on the social media if you're a politician or supporting a political party as the National Party and the Conservative Party have found their cause. It's not popular, but that doesn't mean it's not happening. No, it does happen. Yeah, and, and that does also mean that it's going to get worse. So one of the challenges, Marvin, that we are going to all face, whether we are in Aotearoa, New Zealand, or anywhere else in the world, is that the threats and the risks uh, to our way of life, our democratic, however we want to see it, uh, our way of life is going to come from uh, uh, places and spaces outside the contiguous sovereign territory. And an easier way of saying that is that in the future, uh, the threats and risks are going to come as a consequence of what's happening outside of our or New Zealand as opposed to necessarily what's happening within. You can't stop that. What you can do, however, is to realize that that is going to be the risk landscape and to think about ways from education to policy making to regulations to oversight and may I also add in conversations with social media companies like the Christchurch Call is doing, uh, led by Paul Ash and uh, you know the, the creation of uh, Prime Minister Ardern and President Macron of France as a platform to think about some of these issues on a global level. So that was, a, uh, that was one of the results of uh, the, the awful massacre. Uh, and so the Christchurch call as a platform, but also uh, the more the, the discussions that one is having within Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, what, you know, without discounting what you said, which is that it's not popular to kind of lash out at one's political opponents or, or anybody that you disagree with, really, frankly, uh, that doesn't mean that that's going to stay. And may I just add one word of caution from my research in that I did study the discourse on YouTube and Facebook leading up to the elections last year. And one was disturbed to find uh, significant pockets of uh, the very kinds of hate, hurt, harm and violence and misinformation and disinformation that I found far more familiar back home. So it exists. It's not going to go away. And there's every likelihood that if one is inattentive to uh, the risk of its spread and growth that it will spread and grow at pace and that's something that I certainly don't want out there or New Zealand to experience and I don't think anybody does either okay thank you we'll have some music now and then we'll come back Sure could use a little mercy now The fruits of his labor Falling right slowly on the ground His work is almost over Won't be long He won't be around I love my father He could use some mercy now And my brother He could use a little mercy now He's a stranger to freedom Shackled to fear and doubt The pain that he lives in It's almost more than living will allow I love my brother Summers and my church and my country 
They could use a little mercy now As they sink into a poison pit It's gonna take forever to climb out They carry the weight of the faithful Who follow them down I love my church and country They could use some mercy now Every living thing could use a little mercy now Grace can in the ray towards another mushroom cloud. There's people in power who'll do anything to keep their crown. I love life and life itself Could use some mercy now Hello, friends. That was Mary Gala Galmuther, a uh, American uh, country singer, Mercy Now. And I thought it was an interesting song, though rather long for the radio. <laughs> We're talking with San J Jama from uh, Sri Lanka, but he's actually a, a worldwide. Um, expert on uh, media, social media online, and we're talking about the effect this online media has on society, particularly in times of crisis. Well, could you tell, what about public privacy? Is this, is this an issue, and how do we deal with it? It is. It seems to me that almost anything you say on the telephone or email <laughs> or online, you, you have to assume that it, other people will hear it besides the people that you're talking to. You don't assume that they will, but you have to assume they could. Now, for some people this doesn't matter. For people that just don't care or for people um, they never say anything controversial in their life or do anything controversial. But for other people, it can mean a, a problem later in their careers, for instance. I, I both agree with you, but I also disagree with um, the, the definition as you, as you, as you uh, uh, pitched it. In that, I think that privacy matters and should matter for all of us. Uh, it is a fundamental, uh, not necessarily a right, but it's something that one expects no matter what 
one says and what one does and you can breathe if you have well the thing is that you know in the way that i think that it is most commonly pitched and promoted as you did um, no fault of yours um it seems to be applicable to only those who think of themselves as non controversial but then you go into what is controversy and what can one how what one says how can it be interpreted and another way of looking at it is that i don't necessarily put my um bank account uh, on a window and drive around um i don't necessarily say how much i have in the bank there are things that uh, are deeply personal uh, it could be you know something uh, that we wear that we have in our homes that we do when we are in the men's or women's room in the loo um a particular way we like to brush our teeth i don't know people are people are interesting uh character studies and we all have things that are intimate and private um and should remain as such uh and that goes to the heart of privacy uh and this is a an extremely vital discussion for me uh, maybe not in our terwa but let me explain that we see back home in sri lanka it is something that i'm fairly active and vocal around because Uh, the country does not have privacy protections they're only embryonic at the moment and will take a few years to come really into play but for a variety of reasons that i won't go into because of uh, the limited time that we have uh, citizens of sri lanka don't expect privacy which is a huge issue because our government is rapacious uh, and is intrusive and pervasively so and so the surveillance architectures that we have in sri lanka are really quite horrific because they would target the marginal those at the periphery women uh, minority communities and any person individual community context neighborhood or collective that is seen as projected as or defined as problematic or violent or suspect by the state and that's a, that's not a place you want to be in uh, in our terawa new zealand you have very strong privacy Uh, uh, uh oversight uh, regulations laws some of which actually were were were, were reformed and rebooted uh last year uh, and that's a good thing of course th- your question goes at the heart of another matter which is the more we are on social media uh do we require a revision of what we consider to be private now that is actually a very very interesting question again i mean you know i don't want to bore listeners with the academic framing of this but it seems to be the case that our behavior our content production our engagement our conversations our perceptions of social media uh, and our in and our and our interactions with it are really quite fundamentally different to how we would interact uh, person to person face to face offline and with uh, older uh, broadcast and electronic and print media and so there are different expectations of privacy depending on what you say who you are where you are coming from uh, whether you are pakeha or mari uh, you know what gender and identity you call yourself as and so it's all one big mix on social media so your expectation marvin as you very correctly said might be that you're talking to a specific individual or a specific group of say friends or your collective or your community but if you don't understand the very complicated privacy settings on a platform like facebook and this is by the way a real life example you might find that uh, something that you only ever intended to be uh, read by an intended audience uh, is suddenly now public domain and you know all of us you have with your family uh, dark humor that is understood to be dark humor uh, but of course in the public domain it might be read and understood and perceived and interpreted and defined as something very very different uh, and so the leaking of what you think is more private conversation and content into the public domain is a problem Uh, and of course then you have the other big uh, you know elephant in the room which is again as i said earlier shoshana, uh, shoshana zuboff and others have called this surveillance capitalism it is heinous there is a patina of toxicity around the rapacious nature through which social media companies use us uh, and use our data use our interactions literally by tracking the way we interact with our phone screens literally by tracking how our mouse interacts on a computer uh, 
every click, every pause, every scroll, every selection, every radio button that you clicked is tracked and monetized. And so that is a real problem, Marvin. Mean, we didn't have this kind of company or profit model, uh, you know, a few decades ago. Facebook, I think, is now 17. And, you know, uh, you know, all these big companies are heading into their you know, early 20s right now. Uh, and all of them are now having to grapple with business models that are, you know, harvesting us um, as products, using our information, using our interactions, and then selling back to us things that we might not want or need. And also, as I said, exacerbating uh, social conflict more than helping democratic potential and pathways. So that that model of uh, abusing the trust, implicit trust that we have in our interactions on these platforms is really problematic. So, you know, privacy is a really complicated issue. Uh, you can talk about it yeah. as citizens and state or users and social media or citizens to citizens or communities to communities. But I think that, uh, you know, if I may end, you know, social media cuts across all of that. Yeah, I'm not a, a great user of social media, but I notice on... Amazon on uh, Google that they try to sell me books and so on from a certain event because they know I've read some. That's right. That's right. It's not like I've asked. For no, that. no, no. And is that's that's also how Spotify works. That's also how Netflix recommendations work. That's also how the TikTok algorithm works so well. Uh, all of you know differently, but all of them share the the same uh, engineering principle, which is that they give you more of what you are intently looking out for or have engaged with or have expressed interest around. Yeah. And, it, and it gets actually quite quite bizarre and quite strange and quite violent because sometimes they, they tell you things and they show you things and they give you options and, and they present things that you might not know you, you, you wanted. But when presented, you go like, huh, that's, that's really interesting. Maybe I could use that. Um, and if you accept it, they'll give you more of it. Well, it is a drug, isn't it? And that's that's the profit model. Do we have a a duty almost to regulate social media? I am not sure I would say it is a duty. I think it is a responsibility. A responsibility. I think way. and you know, you know, for for the entirety of this program we've been using social media. And you know what, Marvin? I don't know what social media is because I just call it media. Okay. You know, um, our podcast, for example, is going to be listened to long after uh, we, we exit the studio. Um, today's uh, radio is listened to on mobiles. Today's mm -hmm. television is seen on computers, time shifted, of course. Uh, our, our print media is seen not as newspapers, but as articles packaged and presented on social media news feeds. So it's all one big thing. And I think that one of the things that uh, David Shanks, New Zealand Chief Censor, and others are also grappling with, including in my country, Sri Lanka and elsewhere, is that you know, <laughs> what is media today? <laughs> okay. you know? yeah. And so, in a, in a sense, I think your question goes to the heart of it, which is that y y governments and regulatory authorities and democratic institutions the world over, on both sides of the Atlantic, in the European Union, in India, in Sri Lanka, in the Philippines, in Singapore, in Malaysia, in Australia, and in Aotearoa, New Zealand, they're all struggling with this central challenge and question around how should and how do you regulate media, of which, of course, social media is a great part of and, you know, requires uh, a specific focus on. But it's really the larger media, what you call ecosystem, uh, not unlike uh, any uh, natural wetland or park or, or nature reserve. Uh, uh, the media landscape uh, around the world is actually quite complex and interrelated uh, and to regulate this, I think, is fundamentally important if we want to strengthen democracy and democratic institutions, because let loose, uh, they are going to dilute, corrode, erode, and ultimately destroy uh, the very fabric of electoral integrity and democracy as we know it. I know it because I see it back home. You, I mean, some of the media, new media giants actually believe and brag that they're too big and too important to be regulated. Um, and we, we can see their, their response, for instance, in Australia, when Australia wanted to have some say in 
of journalism and protection of information and, and paying for information if you took it from other from working journalists. And they were insulted by the idea that the government would consider that they could be challenged or regulated. I think they're less likely to be insulted by the European Union because of the size of the European Union. Well, these are hard questions. I mean, in Australia, um, the conversation is very different to the EU and what's coming out of Brussels. Um, uh, it, it, it is complicated and complex. And uh, what one has to also recognize is that, um, as much as I hate to say it, uh, there is some merit to the argument proposed by the likes of Facebook and Google, although they are very different. And of course, as a um, you know, as I said, it's complicated. But uh, when they said that, uh, listen, it's actually more complicated than what the Australian government is proposing it to be, there's some merit to that as well. That is in no way, shape or form taking away from the fact that uh, there is a, what you would call a platform responsibility that these big companies have towards supporting journalism and independent journalism in the contexts uh, that they are uh, present in, also given that um, they have fundamentally changed the nature of journalism and media as an industry, but also as uh, uh, an ecosystem in, in, in many of the markets. It, 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 it's not going to go back to cable TV and, and radio over the airwaves, etc. Um, so I think that you know what's coming out of Brussels is different. Actually, what's coming out of the United States under Biden's administration, looking at uh, this clause called Section 230 is different. India, uh, you know, huge market, 1 billion plus people, world's largest democracy, uh, came out with uh, new uh, media and social media regulations recently. Uh, Singapore came up with some a lot uh, in 2019 or 2020. So, you know, and out there, New Zealand is, is thinking of, of, of reform in this area as well. So, what can we take from all of this complexity? I don't want the listeners to be uh, confused. You know, one of the things is that, and, you know, it, it applies globally, is that a few years ago, Marvin, social media companies wouldn't be in the room when you're talking about regulation. Now they need to be in the room. They are really, along with government, uh, the interlocutor that you really need to figure this out. Uh, and how countries navigate and negotiate this, I think is left up to them, and you know, I, I wouldn't be as bold as to suggest what out there or New Zealand should be looking at. Uh, but I would imagine that you would want to continue with what you enjoy here uh, as a, a, you know a strong democratic fabric, and really bring these companies into a conversation around how that can be strengthened in the future, knowing full well, as I said earlier, that the risks are increasing. Well, the problem is that. The, the goals of a, a democratic government, the goals of a, a media giant may be quite different. Very much so. Uh, and uh, it, it is often always the case. However, Especially if one side feels like they don't, they're too big to, they don't need to negotiate. And I think them. we need to call the bluff, Marvin. I mean, f quite frankly, I think that, listen, for people of, uh, you know, from, 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 from South Asia, uh, it, it's a bit strange to be talking about all of this here in Otago, in Dunedin, in 2021, because these are issues we've been talking about for at least a decade. Uh, but it took the events of the 6th of January in Capitol Hill. It took the, uh, took the events of Brexit. It took the events of the presidential election in 2016 for these companies to recognize and realize and embrace and fully uh, realize the gravity of what we had been from our markets in our locations, in our countries, telling the companies to uh, take care of, you know, to, to take cognizance of. So, you know, you've got to call their bluff, but you also have to recognize that the one thing, you know, if I'm a cynic, that these companies now want to avoid is a bad media story. So there might not be a change of heart within these companies, but they want to avoid a bad media story. And they certainly don't want to be embroiled in uh, a media story that suggests that their platforms have been used to amplify toxicity, hate, harm and violence. And Marvin, may I just say very quickly that both, you know, two big companies, Twitter and Facebook, very, very recently <coughs> have openly come out with, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, human rights policy frameworks uh, and said that they are subscribing now to human rights norms. Now, again, we shouldn't take them at face value, but this is simply not something that they would have said a couple of years ago. And then it is, an, uh, it, it is a potential for governments like Aotearoa and New Zealand to engage with them on, on seeing what can be done. So you're f you say that we can have positive change. 
I, I'm saying that it is useful to be a cautious optimist uh, because uh, otherwise um, you always see uh, what is going wrong and there's a lot of it that's going wrong but my doctoral research at Otago University suggests that uh, a more a rigorous look at what e- is happening on this platform suggests that a lot is going right, a lot can go right and we need to be attentive to those things in order to strengthen them. Well, thanks a lot for coming on and thanks for leaving us with the belief that we can have positive change. Thank you very much, Marvin. This podcast was produced by ORFM Dunedin with support from New Zealand On the Air.